swing. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. I don't believe what I just saw. Frank Robinson was 11 years old when the Major League color barrier was broken in 1947. Although the news passed through Frank's youthful world without much fanfare, he dreamed of following in Jackie Robinson's footsteps. Well, Frank not only realized his dream, but after reaching fourth place on the all-time home run list, he fulfilled his hero's hope as well. I'm extremely proud and pleased to be here this afternoon, but must admit I'm going to be tremendously more pleased and more proud when I look at that third base coaching line one day and see a black face managing in baseball. Everybody wanted to have a piece of Frank Robinson when he first became the first black manager in the major leagues. And it could have been quite a distraction for Frank because there was so much press around. Everywhere I went, it was, how does it feel to be the first black manager? I just wanted to be looked upon and thought of as a major league manager. My head almost blew off and just exploded because you're hearing the same questions. Let's face it, you're black, you're the first black manager in baseball. What does this do to your head? He really didn't want to play baseball anymore at that time. He only wanted to manage, but they asked him to be a player manager in Cleveland because they wanted to draw their fans in. It didn't enter my mind that it was a bold move, but it was a uh, bold move. And anything that went wrong was blamed on the fact that he was black. They needed something to hype the attendance. I mean, the, the team was bad. Some of my associates thought it might damage attendance. The racism is a big thing, especially in those days. And a lot of people would uh, sort of reject the thought that he became manager. We'd have death threats, of course. That's just part of it. He was up giving a speech. And this is the first time in my whole life I some guy right beside me and say, sit down, shut up, nigger. What Frank is able to do is to channel it all onto the field. He can make his case about being uh, black in America, about being a man, by just channeling it in the field, by playing a brand of baseball that will make people re respect him. Frank Robinson, he's a baseball player. And today he went to work as a player manager, the first black man ever to manage a major league baseball team. Cleveland fans gave Robinson a warm welcome on that historic opening day in 1975. It was reminiscent of a World Series. Frank's just sitting there trying to do the lineup card. He's got to get ready to play the game because he's a player manager. I never heard such an outdoor stadium so loud as this. Well, I'd have to say that it's quite a way to break it as a manager. It was the loudest and the longest that I've ever heard in my career. Uh, that the people just wouldn't stop. They wouldn't sit down uh, for the ball game continued. It got to be where it was kind of embarrassing, really. Who could have wrote a better script than for Frank to just walk in there and said, OK, I'm going to manage this game. I'm going to hit a home run. We're going to win the game. We're going to do all the things that we need to do. In 1957, Frank Robinson was the least likely candidate to deliver his race to the managerial level. Though he was named Rookie of the Year the previous season, Robinson was regarded as an angry man. The Reds' front office suggested he become an NAACP member. Gay Paul encouraged him because Robinson had a reputation as a loner, as someone with a chip on his shoulder. Paul felt that if he did go out and join the NAACP, that it would soften his image a little bit. He wouldn't be this scary black man anymore. He would be this uh, gentleman black man who was, who was trying to help society. I said, I'm not going to join the NAACP. I don't have money to be paying for the NAACP. They said, no, the ball club will pay for your membership. A lot of black athletes were reluctant to get involved in anything that brings them high visibility outside of their athletic skills. So there's a certain fear in there, there's a certain sense of protection, and that's what he was going for. He was a ball player, he wanted to be left alone to play ball, he didn't necessarily want to be a spokesman for anyone. In time down the road, I want him out of baseball, fine, but not while I'm playing baseball. He was a firebrand on the field, that's where it all came out of him. And I guess he did so much of that as a ball player that he didn't want to continue doing that in his private life. I hear blacks had come, 
but they didn't really know how to adjust. Yeah, we have them, and they're good, but, I mean, some of them seem to be difficult. They seem to be wanted to be treated with equality, and some of them seem to bring a chip on their shoulder. Frank isn't fake sometimes. I think he probably rubs some people the wrong way, you know, with his frankness and his, and his directness. He's kind of cold and sort of standoffish at first, and as time goes along, you have to earn Frank's respect. They were still looking at Frank as, I won't say an uppity black guy, but a forward one, the way they did with Jackie Robinson in his early years. I'm not the, one of the easiest guys to get along with or get close to in the public, and, and I look at uh, signing an autograph almost as bad as like uh, picking up a rattlesnake. He was sort of a little leery in the beginning, which he is with most people. You can easily be misled by that. Hey, Kai, these new uniforms look older than the old ones, you know? Yeah, and they say Robinson helped design them. It figures. I kind of like the new uniforms, though. You like these? They're so old-fashioned, though. They're so serious. They're... They're so you. Because he never smiled. Uh, at, you know, it was all business. Once he put on the uniform, it was, uh, it was a war with him. I was alone. I've been alone all my life, basically. That's just the way I was. Born August 31st, 1935 in Beaumont, Texas, Robinson was four when his mother moved the family to Alameda, California, then to Oakland two years later. Although Frank never again saw his father, he would bear the psychic scars of his negative predictions. The one thing that really kind of bothered me, and I guess even drove me farther away when people were telling him that I was going to become a professional baseball player, and the comment was he didn't think I would ever be a baseball player because I was too slow. His mother was very, very uh, nice to him because he was the youngest child in the family and let him do what he want, which was to play ball. By the time he was 12 years old, he knew he was going to be a baseball player. Frank would be like, give me a bat, I want to get up there. Whereas others might say, gee, I hope he gets his sort of to come up. That's the confidence that Frank had. And, and Frank would say, please, Mr. Berkovich, if we wouldn't have flipped, let's get up first so we can get up nine times. It was a very unique area in the 50s and 60s in particular. Baseball was really hot. And there was one gentleman in particular. He was the baseball coach at uh, McClyman's High. A guy by the name of George Poles. And he knew talent, and he knew how to work with talent. And he was a father figure and a mentor to the kids in the, in the area. He'd say, you're going to meet people important in life, and you have to learn how to shake hands and to look people in the eye when they, you're spoken to. Frank was very shy, and I think this was hard for him at first. One thing about Frank I'll never forget, he said, George Poles took a switchblade out of my hand and put a baseball bat in turned my life around. It's that attitude that if you wanted to escape and make some money, you could make some money in baseball. And you played and you played and you played all the time. After batting 424 at McClyman's High School in 1953, Robinson signed with Cincinnati, receiving a $3,500 bonus. For the next two years, Frank toured the minors, playing for teams in Utah, Oklahoma, and South Carolina. At each stop, the stings of racism struck deeper. When I tried to go to a movie, and the lady said, we don't serve your kind. I said, what kind is that? She said, we don't serve black people here. And I was crushed. I took my money back, and I was embarrassed and whatever, and I was, I was really hurt as a 17-year-old kid, experiencing that face-to-face -face for the first time. Nothing was integrated uh, at that time, restaurants, he did not eat with the ball club. He didn't uh, stay at the hotel with the ball club. He had to find his own place to have his room and board, and that was it. On the way south, driving a, an expensive car, he had needed car repair. I had to stop on the way, and the people in the garage kept saying, boy, what's the matter with your car? And this, you know, this weighs on people. We'd ride a bus going to the next city traveling, and uh, we'd have to stop to, on some of the long trips to, to eat. Now we had to stay on the bus. 
the other players would get off the bus, go in, sit down, have a nice hot meal, come out and bring us a sandwich. When we were driving home, we stopped in Reno and we went to a restaurant for lunch. And uh, we sat there for a while. Frank said, let's get out of here. I said, why? He said, they're not going to wait on us. He was being heckled, particularly in Columbia, South Carolina, the year before he came up. And this particular night that I'll never forget, they gave him the worst verbal abuse. I never heard anything, not even to this day, as bad as that. I looked at Robinson, I was close to him, and I could see the tears streaming down his cheeks. And as soon as the game was over, Robinson bolted from first base to the bat rack and grabbed a bat. And uh, he was out of control. He was completely irrational, and I could understand. He wanted to kill those two guys. And he had to be restrained, and that would have been a very, very bad thing to have happened. He might have faced some time in uh, prison down there as a consequence if he had managed to get into the stands. Robinson kept his emotions in check by focusing his energies on the game, and in 1956 made it all the way to Cincinnati, where he hoped the social climate would improve. Well, he came from Oakland, California, which was racially diverse, to a city that, for all its pretensions, perhaps, is still a southern city. Uh, it was a city that was very unfriendly to racial diversity. And what he wants to do is keep a low profile as best he can. Uh, he had to keep quiet because in a city like this, at that time, if he'd been very vocal, he would have been um, gone. I think it made me tougher because uh, I just wouldn't let anyone get close to me because I didn't want anyone to say something or do something that would hurt me. It just made me more determined. Frank Robinson had as much guts and courage at hitting a baseball as any man I've ever seen. Mr. Danger, uh, he was the type of guy that uh, the anecdote, don't wake up a sleeping dog. If uh, you wake him up, you're only going to get bit. When I was with the Dodgers as a rookie in 61, Walter Austin said in a pregame meeting, don't throw anything close to Frank Robinson. Don't wake him up. Let him sleep till he gets out of Los Angeles. Well, the first time up, Stan Williams knocked him down, and Austin went berserk on the, in the dugout. He got up, dusted himself off, hit the next pitch almost out of the Coliseum. For the next two games, he was on a hitting rampage. Drysdale's pitching. The go-ahead run is on second base. Robinson comes up, and Austin puts up four fingers because first base is open. The first pitch right here, I mean, had some mustard on it, too. Frank went down like a ton of bricks. Boom! He went down, didn't have helmets in those days. The cap stayed in the air and the body just went down. Wham! You know, ball one. By gosh, he'd get up and he'd get closer, almost illegally closer to the plate, as if to say, you're not going to intimidate me. By this time, you, you'd think that Frank would say, no, I'm not going to get back in the box. But not only that, he got closer, bent over the plate, and sped his drives out. Boom! Down he'd go again. Climb back up, inch a little bit closer, and I was amazed. You would think the Drysdale would go ahead and put the four there. Uh-uh. A little bit more on it and a little bit lower. And Frank again got under it, went down like a ton of bricks. Dust, dirt all over him. And he trust some first base. He was one of the few guys that weren't intimidated by Bob Gibson. He'd bat with his left elbow hanging out over the plate, and Gibson would hit him right here. Next time he came up, there was the elbow again. Give some pitch him out here, and he did it out on the highway in Cincinnati. Two years after setting a rookie record by being hit by a pitch 20 times, Robinson's close to the plate stance cost him dearly in an exhibition game in 1958. A beaning left him with blurred vision. He went down just like he was hit by a bullet. I think I did have fear because when I came back, I was always leaning back on every pitch, leaning back, leaning back. And I had to have a serious talk with myself uh, at the All-Star break. What Frank said to Frank is, do you want to stay in the major leagues? And Frank said, yes. Frank said to Frank, uh, 
Well, then, if you're going to do that, then you got to get your act together and start going into the ball again instead of rocking back on your heels on everything. Well, he finished up with 31 home runs and a 269 batting average. That's what a competitor he was. Robinson's unwillingness to back down sometimes created problems in that socially turbulent world outside the lines. One February night in 61, he and two friends had an argument with some white customers in a Cincinnati diner. Well, Robbie had a habit of staring down people. And he gave a glare, you know, at this cook. And the cook had a knife, and he, he went like this with his knife across his throat. And Robbie wanted to show that he had something better. And he flashed a little Italian ready. And the cook yelled, he's got a gun. I bought the gun down in Florida doing spring training one year just because I thought I should have one. Because at that time, I always carried a, 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 quite a bit of cash on me. The cops frisked Robinson. They had the trial later. He was fined $250 and put on probation. Frank felt under a lot of pressure about that thing. He, he felt that he got a raw deal. Uh, he wasn't threatening anybody. He just uh, uh, happened to have that. And uh, of course, it made a lot of headlines. Well, I think it, it made me sit down and talk to Frank again and understand my responsibility, that I had a responsibility to live my life or conduct myself or carry myself in, in a higher plateau than that. Heeding his own advice, Robinson won the 1961 MVP. He hit 323 and drove in 124 runs, leading the Reds to their first pennant in 21 years. After losing to the Yankees in the World Series, he married Barbara Ann Cole, and for the first time, the shy, contained man began making friends on the team. I felt like it was important for me then to take up the problems and the, the calls on the team uh, whenever they had a uh, gripe with management. And uh, I got a reputation as being a troublemaker because in those days that uh, ownership uh, didn't want uh, players speaking up and speaking out. I was actually called in the Reds' front office for hanging with the black players too much. They were real concerned that I'd be led down the wrong path. And all the path they led me down was to get base hits and score runs and win games. <laughs> and if that's, if that's being a bad guy, then Frank was a terrible person. Despite their open friendship with young second baseman Pete Rose, Robinson and Veda Pinson were labeled a Negro clique in the sports pages. And when the Reds finished a disappointing fourth in 1965, general manager Bill DeWitt dealt Robinson to Baltimore. He was very hurt by the trade. It was a shock to him. Frank, uh, on the field, played as hard as he possibly could and moved well and everything else. But when Frank was off the field, he took his time, you know, and, and walked slowly and uh, didn't rush about anything, which led Bill DeWitt to think that Frank was an old 30. DeWitt knew better than that, but uh, he traded him because he probably was giving him some aggravations. It's like knocking him down. He's going to get up. If you don't want to pitch to him, just pitch around him, but don't wake him up. And that's what the Reds did when they sent him to Baltimore. They woke him up. When he came over here, he came over with a little baggage more than anything else because he had had several uh, problems there in, in the Cincinnati area. I, again, had a talk with Frank. I said, you know, if you're not that way, but if people perceive you to be that way and they look at you that way, then they think you're that way, then maybe you should change. In Frank's first spring training camp with the Orioles, it was clear that the one thing about him that wouldn't change was his bat. So I went up to hit. First pitch, they called to him a little slider. Frank gets out on his front foot, keeps his weight back, keeps the bat back. And he had a double down the third baseline, which was uh, an amazing thing to do when uh, he hadn't seen any batting practice or anything else. Now, that's the first time I ever saw Frank Robbins swing the bat. And I turned to uh, Davey Leonard, who was my roommate, a kid from Baltimore, and I said, I think we just won the pennant. That was the start of one of the greatest years I think any uh, professional baseball player ever had. My goodness, what a blast. Oh, my goodness. We had been a contender in 65, but we didn't quite have enough of a balanced ball club. And Frank came in and immediately gave us power and run production 
and leadership. We had a lot of players that used to talk to other players before the game. He put his foot down right away with that. He thought it was wrong. And I remember him getting up on the top of the steps in the dugout, and he'd be yelling at pitchers, uh, you're never going to get me out again. You throw that junk, and I'm going to take you. And he'd be calling the guys' names, and he'd be yelling and screaming. We'd all be kind of, all the Orioles, you're kind of sitting back on what's going on. While Robinson won over Orioles fans, all was not well outside the ballpark. Racial strife divided urban America, and Baltimore was no exception. This lady said, oh, yes, we have a condo. This condo is available. Mrs. Robinson, yes, glad to have you here. And then the owner, I guess, would see us or see me and decide, no, he's not going to. And I said, why? I couldn't believe it. What this lady thought and figured that uh, she was Brooks Robinson's wife. And when she found out she was Frank Robinson's wife, she didn't have a place for him. A lot of people that came into play here told me about how uh, difficult things would be for me as a black athlete. But when I got here, I think that Frank had already changed that. Robinson's best social persuader remained his bat. Frank Robinson had the only ball still to this day that left Memorial Stadium hit in the parking lot. That ball would have turned the wind around. I mean, that ball was crushed. It was a thing of beauty. And it was off Louis Tion after pitching three straight shutouts. He came back around the bases and he touched home plate and I said, you get it on? He said, no, I just hit it on the end, just a little bit. It still didn't dawn on me until I went back to the outfield at the end of the inning and the 49,000 people stand up, give me a standing ovation. And boy, that just chills went down. So I said, I guess it did go out. And that was a very warm feeling. And from that moment, that moment really solidified me in being accepted. In his first year as an Oriole, Robinson hit 49 homers, drove in 122 runs, and batted 316. He also became the first player to win an MVP award in each league. During that Triple Crown season, Robinson received a major scare at a team pool party. So they started going around throwing people in the pool. So uh, they got to me and I said, hey, come on, boo, good guys, come on, I don't swim. And I said, ah, we know that, but you're going in. I knew he didn't know how to swim. And then he came up and he hollered, and I thought I was just playing around. I came up one time, and I raised my arm up and said, help, help, help. Went back down. Frank had fallen in the pool, and he was drowning. Came up a second time, help, help, help. Went down. Third time I came up, help, help, help. Went down, and I was sitting on the bottom. Andy Etchebaron was sitting there, and he says, Frank, you've been on the bottom of that pool for a long time. I was assigned to die. So I just dove in the pool and went down. I said, oh, thank goodness to myself. Somebody got me, and he saw it push me up. We took him to the side of the pool, worked on him a little bit there, and he was all right. Boy, what a scare. That was really a scare. I sat on the bottom of the pool that time and saw the headlines. And the headline said, Bill DeWitt gets last laugh, Frank Robinson drowns at team party. That October, Baltimore opposed Los Angeles in the World Series. Robinson hit two homers off his nemesis, the hard-throwing Don Drysdale, as the Orioles swept, winning the fourth game 1-0. Robinson, the right-hand batter. Long drive, the left field, way back, way back. Hits it, hit back, home run. He made them believe they could win, and they didn't believe they could win. Uh, he was one of the greatest competitors that I've ever known. In the Oriole way, it wouldn't have meant anything if Frank Robinson hadn't come over in 1966. He made a difference, and that's what superstars do. Starting 1967 in superstar style, Robinson suffered an injury that would impair his ability to hit a baseball. Robinson went into second with spikes up, like always, with a huge slide, and boom, uh, he hits Al Weiss. It was a shot, a tough shot, and they both roll over, and they're both sort of out on the field, both of them. The question was, how did he get injury to his eyes? And you, you don't know whether his uh, head hit my knee or hit the ground afterwards. He was never the same the, the rest of that, uh, that season. The next morning, I went to the hospital to see him. And he's lying in bed, and there's all kinds of IVs sticking out of him and everything, and his eyes are closed. It's get a big bandage over one eye. The ball was up and down this way. Things were that way, not side. 
And I saw two images, and uh, after a month, I came back to play with double vision. He says, I see three balls. And I said, just hit the middle one. <laughs> you know? If you looked at Frank Robinson's torso, naked, you'd see scars all over his body, all over his body, his arms, his chest, his legs. And let me tell you about him. He'd play fair and square, but if his mother was second base or shortstop, look out if he wanted to steal second. Frank wanted to win, and he wanted to win badly, and he would do anything within the rules to win. And if that meant kicking the ball out of a player's glove, that's what, that's what Frank did. If that meant taking out a, a shortstop on a double play, Frank took him out. He'd slide into a base with his spikes kind of high. He liked contact. He liked physical contact. There was one thing that went through your mind when he was on first base. If there is a double play, you better get to the bag and you better get out of the way in a hurry because here comes the freight train and he's coming after you. If they felt that way towards me, I felt like I had the edge. When we went to Japan, we played a promotional tour over there. Frank slid into second base, and he hit this little Japanese second baseman, and he ended up on the grass in left field. I mean, clean on the grass out there. And they said, no like it, no like. He said, we don't do that. Frank says, oh, yes, we do. I remember as a rookie uh, on the double play, when he came after me one time, and my eyes got big as teacups. And I just got the ball and ran into the, into the right field. And when I came into the dugout, I said, who is that guy? And what's he after me for? He said, that's Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson made a very hard slide into third base into Eddie Matthews, trying to dislodge the ball from Matthews' glove. And Matthews then jumped on Frank and lowered the boom. That was the first game of a doubleheader. And, you know, we figured, well, one good thing about it, you know, we're not going to have to face him anymore. So he comes out and he's got band-aids over both eyes and he plays in the second game and hits two home runs against us. And I made a nice running catch and fell over the fence in left field and guess who hit it? Eddie Matthews is foul but made the catch. And Eddie Matthews was very impressed and then he said, that is a way to get back at someone. We're in Fenway, I think, in 1969, and he hits a ball that he thinks is going to be a home run. It hits the top of the wall, and Frank is held to a single. And when the game ends, Earl Weaver goes into his desk, and there on his desk is a little note with a $100 bill saying, you know, I embarrassed baseball, I embarrassed the Orioles. I certainly embarrassed you as our manager, and I, you know, embarrassed all my teammates and, and certainly myself, and uh, I can rest assured that will never happen again. Frank uh, had a great sense of humor, quick-witted, Frank became a big joke around the team after he uh, got to know everyone. For a couple of years in Baltimore, we had a kangaroo court where the players who made errors tonight or stupid plays or didn't do something right would be fined. Frank had the strings of the mop that he put on like the judge, like in England, the, uh, the barristers wear. Well, hey, he had to look the part. Come on. Nobody else could be the judge. He was kind of our guru. He was the judge. I think he took that seriously and took that role with him in other facets of his life and in his career. He didn't want to look bad in his eyes. The mental mistakes, he didn't let that slide. And you would hear from him. There's no doubt. Nineteen sixty-nine. And Pearl Bailey was starring Hello Dolly. When the show ended, Pearl Bailey came out in front of the curtain, and she started to sing, Hello, Frankie, how are you, Frankie? And they got up on the stage, and they were dancing with her and singing along with her. <laughs> and then when it was over, Frank came down, and he said, Well, I might not ever end up as a manager, but I know I can make it in show business. He was thinking right then and there about managing Major League Baseball. When Earl Weaver got the job as manager of the Orioles, Frank Robinson put in motion right then and there whatever it needed to be done to become a manager. Frank would ask me questions about different situations that came up in a ball game. And also, really, when I first became manager, Frank came in and said, uh, Earl, look at anything I can do to help you, you know, at any time, let me know. But it was Weaver who helped Robinson, recommending him for a manager's job in Puerto Rico in the winter of 68. 
Robinson's team won the pennant. Most of the times, he would ask me about a pitch and change. And then it dawned on me that he hated pitchers so bad he didn't even want to talk to them. He didn't want them to even think that he was even remotely trying to be their friend because he figured that they were the enemy. Yeah, I looked at pitchers as enemy because they were. I had to face those guys and compete against them. I had never been close to pitchers. I had never been in pitchers' meetings. I had never been around pitchers. I had never really kind of talked to a pitcher for any length of time. So it took me a while to make that adjustment. When he wasn't managing in Puerto Rico, Robinson was performing his day job with Baltimore. Over six seasons, he led the Birds to four pennants and two World Series titles. He manufactured a run by himself in the sixth game of the 71 World Series that kept the Orioles alive. Franco's already bothered with a bad Achilles tendon in his right leg. There was a base hit to center, short center, and he ran from first to third. Pulled up there, and in the pull-up, he stra sprained a muscle in his other leg. So he's there at third base with one out, and there's a little fly to center field. Not deep at all, and Frank tagged up and came home, slid around the catcher for the winning run at 36 years of age. And that wasn't his game. He was a power player, but they couldn't score that day. You looked at him and you say, well, you know, he didn't have great speed, but he was a great base runner. He didn't have a great arm, but he was a great outfielder. He had instincts for the game. He was the best that I have ever seen at knowing what the pitcher was throwing. Frank could take his hat off, put it in front of his face, and look through one of those little holes in his hat. And I, I asked him, one time, what are you doing? He said, I'm watching the pitcher. Frank brought to the Baltimore Orioles. There's many ways to win a game. Just because you're 0 for 3 one night doesn't mean you didn't have a big part in winning this game for the Baltimore Orioles. After playing for the Dodgers and Angels, Robinson joined the Indians in 1974 and was named player manager after the season. By acting as a DH in an exhibition game in 75, he faced Bob Reynolds, a pitcher whom he had demoted to the minors. And Reynolds called him some vulgar name. With that, Frank said, what did you say? And here comes Reynolds running at him, and Frank hit him. Boom, boom, boom. Well, the media jumped on that and just, just did an unbelievable job on Frank, saying that the manager should be able to control himself more than this. But Frank, the competitor, he was not going to take that kind of stuff. When he was about to be announced that he would manage the Cleveland Indians, I got a call from a Cleveland baseball writer, and this fellow said, well, don't you think major league manager ought to have minor league experience? I should have said, look at Yogi Berra, look at Gil Hodges, both of whom went from players to managers of their teams. It was that reticence about whether a black player could become a manager and do it right, which is still existing. I was scared for him when he went to the ballpark. I was scared for him when he was sitting in the dugout when he went to the mound, because I didn't know what nut may do what. Most of the criticism, in my opinion, was that we uh, weren't winning, but uh, a lot of the criticism was still the same thing, that uh, he's not white, he's black. When Frank Robinson managed the Cleveland Indians, he was very rough. He was a guy who uh, was the first black manager and everything, and people didn't quite know how to take him. And I think he didn't quite know how to take the media. By the time he got to the San Francisco Giants, he was a little bit more polished, but he was still rough. Another owner who called and told me, he said, you really shouldn't hire Frank Robinson. You can't hire him. I said, why not? He said, well, if you, you can't fire him if you hire him. I said, no, I don't believe in that. He said, well, you're going to hire the, you know, a black manager. You just can't fire him. But in August of 1984, two seasons after being voted manager of the year, Robinson did get fired. Four years passed before he got another chance to manage in the majors, but the wait was worth it. When he got to the Baltimore Orioles, I think by that time, Frank Robinson was his own man as a manager, and he was a very good manager. He had the Jerry West, Bill Russell syndrome, great player who couldn't manage players who weren't as good as him. But when he got to the Orioles, he began to understand that these guys aren't me. His first weeks were a test in patience and self-control. Robinson had taken over in the midst of Baltimore's record losing streak of 21 games. I think that 88 was a good experience for him, even though it killed him inside. I mean, he was dying a slow death inside, day in, day out, losing. And the camera's on you every move. You couldn't even pick your nose or anything because there's a camera on you, click, click, in the dugout or wherever. 
It was really hard and very embarrassing for those players. Every day, an hour before the game, an hour after the game, Frank Robinson carried them by being available, by being funny. The President of the United States called Frank in the middle of the 21 game losing streak just to offer support. I said, Frank, what did he say? He said, Frank, I know what you're going through. And Frank said, Mr. President, you got no idea what I'm going through. It even got to the point there was a representation from Japan. I wanted to know what's going on. Tell the people, tell your fans over in Japan how you feel. I said, geez, how do you think I feel? I can't say it in Japanese. And it was one of the more amazing sights I've ever seen is how that town embraced this team this team that was so unbelievably bad. But one reason was they became a lovable group, and part of that reason was Frank Robinson. And lo and behold, the following year, with a payroll of between eight and nine million dollars, with a very young club and a spotty pitching staff, Frank took the club all the way to an improvement of 32 and a half games, and we weren't eliminated from the race until the next the last day of the season against the Toronto Blue Jays. And for me, that ranks with one of the greatest managerial jobs in the history of the game. Robinson was named Manager of the Year, giving him the honor in both leagues. There's nothing wrong with teammates going over that, hey, keep your head up. We'll get them tomorrow. You'll win the ball game for us tomorrow. It doesn't always have to be management picking players up. A manager has to know who to pat on the back, uh, who to put his arm around, uh, who to kick in the tail end a little bit. And I think uh, Frank probably had a pretty good understanding by personalities. And he did a lot of it through getting on you, ragging on you a little bit, uh, making it humorous. He was a, a type of manager who was always trying to intimidate you. But it was all in jest. And a lot of people didn't quite realize that. He's a guy that no matter what you ask him the first question, his objective was to get you back on your heels. And that would turn a lot of people off and they would be afraid of him. But well, once you stood up to him, just like you were a pitcher standing up to Frank Robinson, he was okay. I think Frank, out of all the managers that I was ever around, was respected as much or more as any manager I ever played for. Everybody knew that he'd done it. I mean, there was nothing that you could do that he hadn't done. I replaced him as a manager of the Cleveland Indians, and I, that was the most traumatic day of my life. I said, Frank, I don't, I don't want your job. And he sat there at his desk, and the two of us both started to cry. Frank called me every day, my first eight to ten days managing the club, going over strategy, what we should do, and so on. This is Frank Robinson, whom they took the job from, for him to call me to try to help me. The guy that replaced him. What does that tell you about him? He broke a barrier. And it seems to be indicative of people with, with the name, last name of Robinson. Frank Robinson, to me, is one of those icons that you look to. He, he's almost like security for young black managers. When Sports Century returns, we'll measure the legacy of Hall of Famer Frank Robinson, asking why, after more than 50 years in baseball, he remains unfulfilled. Frank was about 50 years old, and he's playing in an old-timers game, and he's facing Jim Bibby, who's a huge guy and is only a couple years out of retirement, and he's still throwing hard. So in this old-timers game, he knocks Frank Robinson down, and Frank Robinson gets up and hits the next pitch over the left center field fence at Arlington Stadium for a home run. And I said, this is the same guy that I watched do this when I was a kid, and now he's doing it when he's 50 years old. Despite winning a Triple Crown, an MVP in each league, and hitting 586 home runs, Robinson was not selected for the All-Century team in 1999. <laughs> that makes me laugh. When I saw those guys picking out the All-Century team, and I didn't see Frank Robinson's name in that thing, and I said, what a joke this is. I know I'm not real popular maybe out there as some of the other guys are among the fans. And it, it does bother me. I would have loved to have made the All-Century team. He didn't have the, the flair and the charisma of a Willie Mays. He didn't have that pizzazz of a Clemente. 
he didn't seem to, to have the popularity of, uh, among the, the fans of uh, Hank Aaron. But he could do anything that any of those other players can do, and better than a lot of them. Back in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't the exposure of players in cities such as Cincinnati or Baltimore. So I think if he had been playing right field in New York City, then he would have received far more recognition for that stage of the baseball life. One of the reasons I believe Frank Robinson gets overlooked is because of his personality. He's very combative. He's a, he's a guy that doesn't give in. Everything that made him great as a ball player is what, what probably hurt him off the field. I've never been interviewed for a general manager's job. And that, that's, that's very disappointing. That, that would be the one thing that probably would bother me the most over, over my lifetime uh, about baseball. In 2002, Robinson ended a three-year tenure as Major League Baseball's Vice President of On-Field Operations to accept an offer to manage the lackluster Expos, and we led to their first winning season since 1996. After the Expos moved to Washington, D.C. as the Nationals in 2005, Robinson managed two more seasons before the team decided not to re-sign him. He has the background as a coach, as a manager, as an administrator in central baseball, and all those years in the game, anyone who cares about the game ought to have great respect for him and ought to want to be around him to soak up some of what he knows. I want to give something back, and I feel like I have something to give back to baseball, period. I want to be around baseball. And the day that I feel like that I have nothing to give or nothing to offer to baseball, that's when I will then will fade off into the sunset and enjoy life. Robinson's number 20 was the first number ever retired by the Orioles. Cincinnati didn't hang his jersey from the rafters until 1998, 32 years after he was traded and 16 years after his entry into baseball's Hall of Fame, where he remains for eternity wearing a Baltimore cap. For ESPN Classic Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.